everybody welcome to the em code i'm dr vijiha emergency physician by occupation join my quest in asking right questions from right people to get right answers i guess for today is dr lakshya janana he is emergency physician registrar uh, working in the uk right now uh, he has taken time out of his busy schedule thank you so much for joining the em code dr lakshya hi vijiha first of all before we start uh, apologies for doing this while sitting in my car i'm i've just finished my fourth back to back night shift and uh, i eventually figured out i'll have to do this today if not today i don't know how and when i'm going to get this done uh, and thank you so much for uh, doing this i think what you're doing is absolutely brilliant it's going to be a great resource your youtube channel for anyone especially from the indian subcontinent who is looking forward to do emergency medicine or is thinking about doing emergency medicine as a specialty it's really nice to hear from other people and get their opinions their perspectives and insight about em as a specialty about what the future can hold if you are doing emergency medicine so it's really great my first question to you would be why did you choose emergency medicine as a specialty what aspect of the specialty made you choose it as your career so i developed my interest in emergency medicine back from the days of my internship about 10 years ago so as an intern we used to spend two week, two week blocks in the emergency department which i did and i i was uh, doing my internship at cmc valor and that was one of the biggest and i suppose the busiest emergency department i think it still is uh, back in 2011 so as an intern i got to see some great pathology got to see some very interesting diseases got to see some very fancy procedures and in fact i if i remember i did a couple of intubations under supervision as an intern which uh, was really cool at that point so procedures really drew me towards this specialty to start with then there were other bits like um, shift work which i really used to like and um, communication skills you need to develop a quick rapport with the patients and you're actually trying to help them on the worst possible day of their lives so i thought this will be quite good and satisfying as a long term career option no wonder handling airways the most fascinating aspect of being an emergency physician from first year till the end of your career talking about the next topic of em as a sub specialty em is like a really vast topic to cover so what aspect of emergency medicine interests you put some light on that you totally right em is quite a vast specialty and there are so many sub specialties that can actually stem out of emergency medicine something that i really like is looking after people with chest pain and cardiological emergencies arrhythmias things like pulmonary edema ecg changes subtle ecg changes in um, myocardial ischemia or broadly speaking acs other things that i've recently started liking is uh, pediatric uh, emergency medicine and uh, also minor injuries that's also both these are quite rewarding because you can actually see them treat them and uh, fix their problem and get them away so that's that's also quite rewarding these two pediatric emergency medicine looking after unwell kids and uh, also minor injuries in terms of doing further specialization and sub specialty training i think at one point in your career it becomes really important because um doing a sub specialization whether that's in airway or that's in ultrasound or simulation that gives you a sense of importance and you feel like an expert which you sometimes you it's not a great feeling that when feeling like a generalist uh i think people who are experts they are often um given more uh importance and uh, sometimes it is just being honest it's it's nice to have that feeling of uh, you know being called for a referral if you're being called for a difficult airway or if you're being called for a teaching session if you've got a um if you've done some sort of clinical educator program or a teaching fellowship there are tons and tons of options i think there're more in the us from what i remember there're like 12 or 15 options in the us including ed administration fellowship ultrasound um wilderness medicine a uh, simulation em cardiology fellowship em geriatrics fellowship em neurology so this this every in every specialty there is obviously you can learn more about the emergencies in that specialty and obviously you will know much more about that specialty as compared to a general emergency physician in terms of what you need to choose is i think if you're going abroad and doing a fellowship and coming back 
I'm not sure how useful a clinical fellowship would be. I think ultrasound would be quite helpful in that sense. Um, simulation would be quite helpful. Teaching would be quite helpful. But again, it, it's the situation is the Indian healthcare system. It works in a very different way. Are you where are you going going to work after doing the teaching fellowship? Are you going to work in a government hospital? Would they accept MCAM? Would they employ you because you've got a teaching credential with you, a teaching fellowship for a year? And now these are the questions. Um, I don't have an answer for these questions, but I, I would just think about these. Where I'm going to work? Who I'm going to teach if I'm do, doing a teaching fellowship? So I think clinical fellowships might be less useful and I don't know how it will change your job profile from an Indian standpoint. If you're coming to the UK, now if you, most people come here as a middle grade doctor or what we call a specialty grade doctor or staff grade or clinical fellow, senior clinical fellow, there are hospitals that would take you, give you like 80% EM and 20% pre-hospital, 80% EM and 20% uh, ITU, 80% EM and 20% ultrasound. Uh, I think that's a good way to develop your interest, but again, I'm not sure how useful it, it will be if you do something about pre-hospital medicine and go back. I think it's important to do something additional apart from just EM, but again, think about where you're going to practice, whether you're gonna practice in India eventually or whether you're gonna practice in the UK. It's quite difficult to do a fellowship in EM or in an EM subspecialty in one country and go back and start practicing in your country where you did your primary training from, if that makes sense. So choose uh, choose carefully. I think non-clinical ones would be more helpful in setting up a simulation program, in setting up an ultrasound program and things like that. For sure, the cardiac emergencies and the pediatric emergencies need immediate care. And if things are done right, we see amazing results. And I can know, I can do nothing but agree with you. My next question to you would be, how, what aspect of the emergency medicine do you find more stressful? How do you try and disconnect from it? No wonder handling airway is the most fascinating aspect of being emergency physician from first year till the end of your career. Talking about the next topic of EM as a subspecialty. EM is like a really vast topic to cover. So what aspect of emergency medicine interests you? Put some light on that. I think EM can be quite challenging. So I mentioned one of the reasons that pulled me towards EM is shift work. But as you age or as you, uh, when you get married, you have kids, shift work actually makes life a little bit difficult now that's just i'm just being honest so everything is not good about em so shift work is potential now i see it as a problem in 40s and 50s it, it'll be quite difficult of course your shifts get shorter and you don't tend to do so many nights in at least in the uk but shift work eventually becomes a problem as a trainee i often struggle to uh, go for nights and come back after night shift and look after my son for four or six hours because it also depends what your partner is doing if your partner is working if he or she is working in em or if he or she is doing a nine to five job and that can help or if you have child care so there are a lot of things if your partner is also in em and you have kids then you really have to plan it out now that can be quite stressful at some points Dr. Lakshya, I've seen you try creating awareness about emergency medicine. You've been doing it for a while now. Tell us about the projects you have done so far. So back in 2015, I came up with this Facebook page called EM Academy just to promote discussions among the residents, share online content, uh, good stuff that I read on the social media for med resources. And uh, following that in 2015, uh, so just after I came back from US, so I did a I attended a couple of conferences there and I did this teaching course which was uh, which used to be organized by the University of Maryland School of Medicine by Rob Rogers he's one of the emergency physicians uh, there in the US uh, so I attended this five-day course where they taught us how to teach for five days how to give feedback how to make a podcast how to engage with audience and that was back in 2015 and also the concept of flipped classroom where 
the residents uh, see a video or see a podcast or uh, listen to a podcast get the basic facts do the foundation uh, of the learning set the basics right and then come back and discuss things with you rather than you just teaching them or regurgitating the facts from the textbook so for example you read about uh, abg or listen to podcast about abg and come back and solve five problems of abg rather than me telling you uh, this is metabolic acidosis the sigma this is mud piles so that was quite a nice uh, thing and i was really stimulated to do something like that after i came back from the us and then i opened this blog i did some podcasts on diseases that are commonly seen in the indian subcontinent like snake bite rabies some tropical diseases like tangy and i think there was one on malaria as well if i'm if i remember so it's been a long time i'm not very active on that now but recently we have started a youtube channel with one of my colleagues uh, uh, his name is apurva he is uh, he was uh, one of my co trainees uh, at hyderabad and now he's here with me in edinburgh so we have started a youtube channel called uh, chai mad uh, which is a c h a i space mad where we again chat about um, common things that we see in the emergency medicine and we are just trying to get more active on that and post more videos i think uh, we're going to get eventually more active there and engage with uh, students and the people there we have done a series on um, uh, caesar and cct talking about uh, how to come to uk what are the things you need uh, and i uh, recently talked about how to prepare for oscis there so we are getting there once you have moved to the uk how do you get used to their culture having worked in a, the indian uh, culture things are pretty different obviously the west and our desi culture so how do you get aligned with the what's up what are the the only one thing that i can think of that would have been beneficial if i knew it earlier would be the training process the training pathway now i worked as a, after moving to london i worked as a specialty doctor for a couple of years and it took a fair amount of time at least a few months maybe a year or more to understand how this whole training process works because there were new terms and that didn't make sense to me and uh, i understood properly only after joining the training program so what is caesar what is uh, a training program like higher specialty training what is dream so it it's complicated and it keeps on changing and uh, it took me a long long time to understand this because nobody really knew how this works the trainees knew about the training pathway and there were very few people that i knew who were doing the caesar so it was quite tricky and um, i wish i would have known that earlier so uh, that's the only thing i can think of at this point the typical asian mentality goes like people tend to settle down after mrkm so i would want to know your perspective of frkm over mrkm when and where are they useful when should you stop what are, what should your goals be to be stop at mrkm and if you are uh, what should you be aiming at if you are doing mrkm yeah i agree with you i think that's the general mentality to do mrkm and then um, just stop there um, so mrkm is Uh, a set of exams that anybody can take there is no s- specified time that you need to uh, do a training uh, uh, apart from what the college says so it's not really a 3 year program you can take the exam in 2 years if you have worked in em for 2 years there is a set criteria to take the exam you just need to fit into that you don't really need to work in emergency department at least this was the case when i was uh, and i took em chem as you said the indian mentality is to take mcam and then just stop the problem is in fcam if you want to do fcam you you need to i think you need to work here to do fcam you can actually do fcam from india or any other country as well but then you will have a credential from the uk but you have never worked in the uk so i don't know how that will look on your portfolio uh it's important to learn about how nhs works and that's one of the big things that you learn in fcam so fcam is about learning management learning about nhs and just refining your mcam knowledge and knowing more about the evidence behind things doing about doing a bit of critical appraisal and uh, 
there was a quip as well until recently now they've taken it off as a formal exam but that will happen locally and that's been added to the curriculum i think afkim is more about learning communication and management and the structure of nhs of course there are a few skills in fkm that you learn as a part of as a, when you work in the uk emergency departments like uh, things like nerve blocks fascia like a block for a femur fracture um, they do a fair bit of ultrasound but they cover only four things so we tend not to go beyond those four things which is iota scan for triple a iv access peripheral or central iv access um, echo life support and uh, then the last one is fast which is pretty much obsolete now given we scan pretty much anyone who comes with trauma and a significant uh, with a significant mechanism so this is what you do in fkm in mkm i think if you ask me my knowledge how much that has changed obviously i have knowledge is a lifelong i mean you continue to gain knowledge this is a lifelong process i have learned but i'm not sure if i have learned that because i have taken fkm exams or if i have been doing my own reading so your knowledge will pretty much stay the same if you don't read it for yourself um it's important to do fkm i think that's a credential that is internationally accepted you can even mkm as well but that's uh, uh, that will give you a tick on your higher specialty training so emergency medicine training in the uk let's say last for 6 years mkm is you've old after 3 years and you stop there if you want to move ahead maybe go to middle east maybe go to singapore maybe go to australia it's nice to have fkm with you if you want to work only in india i don't think fkm is very helpful of course you will if you want to do it for yourself that's fine you'll have a higher credential but if so one of my bosses uh five years back told this to me now he has got mkm he's working in india in a corporate hospital for 10 years he's the head of the department if i do fkm and if i go there would the hospital employ me or would keep would the hospital keep him obviously the hospital will keep him in terms of um getting a consultant position or head of the department if that's what your goal is uh i think you'll still need to go to a new hospital uh it's very complicated how things work in india at this point because as i said it's private and government hospital i'm not sure what's the current status of fkm with the private uh, with the public uh, hospitals with the government hospitals and private hospitals basically revenue generating is one of the big things and uh, for them how important it is to employ a head of the department or employ a consultant with mkm or fkm i think for them it will not really matter but uh, you will definitely gain uh, some knowledge you will gain some skills you'll probably lose some skills and uh, learn more about nhs management and the structure of nhs and it's it's more about communication as well so that's that's what you learn in fkm migrating from one country to another at a student level is really challenging whether you are a doctor or an engineer so what are the challenges you have faced uh, while moving to the uk and any financial advice you'd like to give to the uh, residents who are planning to move to the uk well the whole system of practicing medicine is very different in the uk it's important to learn and understand about nhs so if you're coming here gmc does some uh, workshops about uh, introduction to nhs for imgs international medical graduates so i highly recommend attending one of them um, they probably should be doing some online uh, workshops as well so if you're coming here uh, anytime soon or next year or you have plans later this year uh, just check out the gmc website for the introductory or welcome workshop for international medical graduates i found that really helpful i think one of the big things is as i mentioned communication you need to make sure you have excellent communication skills if you don't have start working on them uh, right away um, the way you express yourself the way you talk to the patient your body language everything is really important and i think that's the key for being a successful doctor in the uk after having studied the curriculum for so many years uh, having worked in different setups of india in the eds of india and the uk what are the things you would want to 
change or what are the changes you would like to suggest the college to change your perspective? I think that's a great question. Changes that I would like to see in the EM curriculum in uh, India or EM education in India. I would like to see a blog or a podcast or a podcast coming up from an Indian emergency medicine residency program. It can be private or public sector without saying any names. So I would definitely like to see that. There's a lot of format that we are already using. I think we should get teaching from uh, more teaching from our own consultants as in your own emergency department consultants rather than going on um, social media and uh, listening to what's going on in the US because you won't be really able to replicate the same things in India. So it's really important to discuss anything that you find or read on social media, discuss with your own boss or own consultant and see how that thing will pan out in your own emergency department. So I would like to see these discussions happening. I would like residents to use more of social media and question everything critically think about everything that they are reading or listening or seeing on the podcast with the, with lot of uncertainty around the exam the part c of mrcm or what we call the oski with a new pattern altogether and it happening after a long time what's your advice to the students who are appearing for the exam well, oski is the exams are going to happen at some point uh, at least in the uk now i'm not sure what the college is doing with uh, india they are conducting virtual oskis where you just sit in front of the screen like i am now and uh, give exam and the actor and the examiner they are sitting on the other side so oski is going to happen um, if you look at it positively it'll be less stressful because you are just sitting in your room and you're talking to a screen rather than going to london or going physically somewhere and uh, doing the exam with three other people in the room and i think that's more stressful having thought about it um i think my advice to residents would be just just go slow everybody's going through the same anxieties and same phase so if there is a delay or if there's a break in your career if you're thinking like that it's the same for everyone and things will eventually get better um you will need to get comfortable uh while talking to a screen so uh, i think the exams will probably happen like that for next few sessions or few months or who knows few years so it will happen uh, just keep preparing for that and uh, keep a watch on the rkm website when the exam is going to happen and uh, the way to prepare the exam would be just record yourself look at your own video and work on your expressions your uh, tone of your voice um, and uh, your communication skills that's where the exam is focused on now because they can't test much of resuscitation so it's about communication it's all about communication oskies um of course knowledge is important but in the end it's communication your uh, how, basic etiquette how you carry yourself how you speak to the patient and uh, just just being uh, nice uh, with the patients and then of course knowledge is important as well If you're working as emergency physician in India or the UK, you cannot not talk about the elephant in the room, the COVID-19 pandemic. So, what were your best and the worst experiences like? And uh, yeah, do share some with us. In terms of my best and worst experience uh, in the pandemic, I can't recall of anything uh, that I would call the best experience. In terms of the worst experience, now this was the early lockdown in the UK when I saw like. 40 year old I was just reading about the death rates obviously I was worried um in different age groups so it was pretty low for somebody under 40 so when I saw a 39 year old man who was obviously came with breathlessness temperature day 9 day 10 quite breathless and uh, his sats were like 75% and he was on 15 liters non breather so I asked him to have any comorbidities and he was maybe had a little bit of belly fat but nothing else he didn't have any diabetes or high blood pressure and that made me really worried I was like how come this man has got so sick he doesn't have any comorbidities I mean obesity is one of the risk factors for getting severe disease now we know but at that point uh, I thought he doesn't have diabetes doesn't have hypertension doesn't have heart disease he's not on a single medication how did he get this disease and that's one of the worst 
moments and eventually he did well he was extubated tube then extubated on day 12 had some post-traumatic stress uh, because of the prolonged admission um, and uh, eventually he did uh, reasonably well but that was one of the most scariest uh, moments that i can recall from from the last year but like everyone else i have had my share of anxiety and uh, I've thought about this, if I go to ITU, if I end up being tubed or going to the ventilator or becoming very sick, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen to my near and dear ones? So I've been anxious about it in the past. Um, things are luckily getting better now. Uh, fortunately, we have got all the resources. We have got all the supply of um, PPE uh, in the UK. And uh, I know it's really difficult for my colleagues, for my friends, in India and for my family the last couple of months when um, most of my family, my parents uh, and all other um, near and dear ones back home, they, they got COVID and there was no place to go because they, there was no hospital bed. So it was quite a tricky situation and I was getting phone calls and I made a few phone calls, but it, it was um, quite a difficult situation the last um, couple of months. and. I have I have actually no shame in admitting when when the pandemic uh, was on early in February and March 2020, I used to think that this is just a common cold and this is going to pass off and it's possibly blown up by social media. But I was obviously wrong. By the time the lockdown came to UK and I realized this is I, I'm wrong. This is something more than that. This is more serious. When when I read more about it. Obviously, the numbers were staggering, the deaths were staggering, and uh, obviously with the recent hit in India and Delhi, um, things have changed dramatically. So it's been it's been quite a, a difficult experience, uh, but luckily things are getting better on both the ends now. I'm not an expert in giving the financial <laughs> advice, but uh, I think we're coming here in terms of money that you need to save uh, you need to get at least two thousand pounds per person because you will get your salary a month a month and a half later when you come here so if you are coming with your partner get at least four to five thousand pounds in terms of the advice on saving money i think one of the most expensive things is to eat outside here and uh, renting so you can't do much about renting but if you are coming here and if your goal is to save money for future and uh, and I think my only piece of advice would be to learn how to cook and that way you'll be able to save a whole lot of money. Thank you so much for sharing your initiative, Dr. Lakshya. It's really cool. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sharing your ideas with us on the EM Core. It was a pleasure having you. Well, once again, Vijaya, thank you so much for reaching out and I really appreciate you doing this. I'm sure this is going to be a great resource for the residents and medical students. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.